throughout the past days, and especially yesterday, I um, honed in on the fact that um, your sales skills, and I, my sales skills I developed from door to door to selling governments, ultimately. Obviously making more money every time I up, upgraded my uh, prospect. Some of you, most of you, equate sales, as I just said the day before yesterday, with uh, car salesmen, insurance salesmen, door-to-door -door salesmen. Hence, even though on a conscious level you might not think of it that way, at a subconscious level you have disdain for sales. This is a sales program, 100%. It's nothing more. We're like a fucking five pound hooker standing at a corner with our dress up. Nothing more. We're whores. Nothing more. And if you can't swallow that, pun intended, <laughs> swallow that, you're going to have a hard fucking time with this. I keep, I collect frogs. I have probably 300 frogs, um, probably more. I, I have frog ties, I have frog cuff, cuff links, which I'm not wearing today. Why do I? Because I know, for me, default is to stop kissing frogs. Kissing frogs meaning turning over rocks, looking for deals, looking for mentees, looking for devotees, looking for money. The reason that I was able to raise as much money during several major declines, not the least of which was the first decline when oil went from $41 a barrel to $6 a barrel, is because I wore not my feet out, my knees out, crawling around begging for money. Begging for money. Begging like a fucking beggar in the street. Because I had no pride. Most people can't do that. In fact, hardly any people can do it. But the ones that come closest to being able to beg for money are up there. Because you, you, you think of the word beg, you think of homeless and all the things that go associated with it. And now they call it sleeping rough. Sleeping rough to me was having sex with three girls at the same time. That was sleeping rough to me. But now it's all sleeping rough means you're in the street, you're sleeping on a park bench or some bullshit. If you don't kiss frogs, and this is just yet another gift from somebody, I mean, some of you will equate kissing frogs with kissing ass. And your parents didn't tell you to be an ass kisser, did they? Anybody in this room, her mother, their mother or father say, be an ass kisser, be a brown noser? I don't think so. And by the way, here is, here's a picture, pass it around, this is a picture of Shekels in his prime. Every class has got a whipping boy and a whipping girl. Look at, it's hard to believe that he used to look like that, you know? You know what I'm saying? It's hard to believe. And so, but I, I've kissed so much, so many frogs, turned over so many stones, knocked on so many doors, been, I've been spit on, slapped, door slammed in my face. But I just kept going door to door. Because to me, default of being poor was not acceptable. There was, I'd rather be dead. Now see, some of you say you'd rather be dead than poor. You're full of shit. There's not a person in this fucking room, and only that many people in 26 years in this room that would rather be dead than poor. Life is precious. Right? Not to me. Not if I'm going to be fucking poor. I've been rich and I've been fucking poor. And there's no fucking comparison. Sally and I would rather somebody put a bullet in our fucking head than be poor again. Sally lived in a caravan about this, this is no shit, a caravan about this big. Family of six. 
I was rich compared to her, as she would tell you, after a couple of champagnes, which isn't exactly accurate, but it's okay after all these years. But you got to kiss frogs. Ozon, Churchill have been kissing more frogs while in school than the other son of a bitches that have come through the program in the last two or three years full time. They quit their job and are pursuing this 100%. How is that possible? Because they would rather be dead than poor. Because they are poor. Some of you watching and sitting in this room think you're poor. As Sally would say, and I can't do it with the right Yorkshire accent, you're living in the lap of luxury. The lap, la, la, anyway, you know, with the Yorkshire accent, the lap of luxury. We're going to be talking to a guy today um, who didn't really want to talk to you, except one of the stars. Why didn't he want to talk to you? Because he knows he's not going to make any difference with you. He's not going to touch any of you. He's arrogant and super successful. But he's going to talk anyway. Thank you, Jason. But he wrote me a little primer. And he brought me up to date on what he's been doing. He's been doing super, to say uh, the least. But at the end, he says, um, if the morons ask stupid questions, or if you have already covered the obvious details with them, I will tell them to fuck off and hang up. That's the real world. That's the Steve Jobs world. They don't have time for idiots. And if you had read all the materials I told you to read before you got here, you would have 98% less questions. So either you read the material or you're fucking really brain dead and retarded, or you didn't read the shit. Most of you didn't read it. I'd like to think that you're not really, you know, an amoeba with 20 IQ. Sally says I probably am overestimating. It's a bridge too far. But if you don't kiss ass, you're never going to make it. Never. Not going to happen. Now, last night you saw the biggest shit bag of them all, Andrew Carnegie who I give all the credit in the world for because I, I am copying his model. Unlike the other gurus that copy me and copy other people, we give no credit. He was doing this in the late 1800s. And he did it not just because he was a cheap bastard Scotsman, but he did it because he didn't want to give up ownership in his deals by taking equity in, deal, in his transactions. What are the takeaways of Mr. Carnegie? On Carnegie. Yes, sir. He had an experience early in his life when his father had to go out and beg for work, and his mother was crying, and it seems like that stuck with him and drove him through his whole life. Mm-hmm. He was absolutely willing to do whatever it took to win, no matter how long, whatever. No matter how despicable. And towards the end of his life, as do most of the guys, myself included, he wanted to uh, buy, if there is a heaven, let's buy our way into it. It's not an accident that all the rich guys and gals try to buy their way into Valhalla, just in case it exists. But it's at the end of their fucking life, after they raped, pillaged, and fucking plundered everybody. They killed everybody. Then... They saw the light. They didn't see the light early in their careers. It's none of these young guys doing it. None of these young gals. It's all the old gits. And especially they do it a la Steve Jobs when they're going to die. 
if I were, Jobs was either an agnostic or atheist or whatever, he didn't believe in anything until he got cancer. Then he was a believer, and then in his judgment, he took the easiest way out, which was Buddha. Now, I don't know if that's the easiest religion. I don't know that for a fact. But he took Buddha to uh, go off into glory. What else about uh, Mr. Carnegie? Uh, he's used to under the bus. There's a success leaves clues. So far, just about everybody that you've, you've, you've listened to threw somebody under the bus. Left your own devices, it's going to be you they threw under the bus. And I keep on, and he, you look at me, and years ago we used to camp, film it this way. And then it got so debilitating because you, you didn't want to see. I keep telling you they're going to cut your throat. I keep telling you they're going to cut your fucking ears off. I keep telling you they're going to cut your dick off and shove it down your wife's throat. I keep telling you that, but you just sit there like, no, that can't be. That won't happen to me. Like it's a fucking cartoon. And they're going to cut your throat. I can make you CEO, but I can't make people respect you. And as soon as you open your fucking mealy mouth, your spineless fucking mouth, they're gonna jump, they're gonna jump all over you. And I go through all this heartache telling you how to set up the meeting, and you're just looking. They're gonna, they're gonna, you know, it's, it's you know, like in World War I, the Battle of the Somme, They've got a little uh, young uh, British lieutenant, or, and he, uh, okay, lads, have a smoke, and they're having some Dutch courage. They have a, little, they have a drink before they're going to go over the top, knowing that one out of every three is going to be dead, and one out of three will be wounded or maimed, and one will live. And you're in the ditches here, and, it's, you know, and, and you're walking around in shit because there's no toilets, and, and he blows the whistle, <laughs> okay, lads, over the top. Nobody's following you over nothing. Now, why would all these guys follow this little skinny guy with he's got a little swagger stick under his arm, right? A little whistle and a little pistol. <laughs> why? Well, a lot of training. Leadership. And when you have that, oh, God forbid, that first board meeting, I mean, and you go to, and you swallow the whistle. <laughs> I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. You've got to take control. And the guys and the gals that have the, the best, or the least worst, I'll put it another way, the least worst leadership skills do the best. Sometimes it's people from their athletic background. Some of the military guys that I've had the pleasure of uh, working with. But I can assure you, you're going to get shrapnel and you're going to get scar tissue uh, the first few meetings. Just as, and that's why the system is set up, anchor chairman. And by the time you get through all the accountants, the lawyers, the bank interviews, the um, uh, potential sellers, the motivated sellers, and then a board meeting. So in, in theory, you've had 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 meetings in preparation for the big meeting, the board meeting, which is probably the most important meeting. And so you can lean back on all the experience of all those other meetings. And it'll still be hard. It'll still be hard. Because, you know, it's, it's uh, I didn't find it difficult, but a 28-year-old or a 35-year-old Firing a 70-year-old is not easy because of the brainwashing. He's old enough to be my grandfather. He's old enough to be my father, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some of you didn't like your grandfather or your father, so it's easier. But yet again, with all those speed bumps, this is still the only game in town. You can do it with no money. No money, no experience. One or two of you asked me um, yesterday, if I really didn't have any experience in oil and gas. 
May God strike my three children and my two grandchildren dead this fucking instant if I knew one syllable of anything. Some say the reason I made so much money in a collapsing market is because I didn't know anything. Because I didn't know how bad it really was. That's possible. Because it was ugly. 10,000 energy companies went out of business. Kaput. Bankrupt. And we were the fastest growing energy company on the planet. And a, a famous line in the Financial Times, which you can Google uh, still. Uh, I'm being interviewed by the Financial Times, a young woman named Cohen, I still remember her name. And I tell her sarcastically, uh, the board, uh, we have taken the decision not to participate in the energy depression, actually. I was, I was blowing smoke up her fanny. It's in the newspaper. Another quote, same interview. Well, you're going back and forth between the Netherlands, Amsterdam, Houston, and London. Okay? Because um, we were public on London and in Amsterdam. And they says, well, don't you uh, suffer um, from jet lag? And I said, actually, jet lag are for cunts. Leadership. What else about Carnegie? I think he started, was it seven bucks a month or seven bucks a week? When he first started, they got paid. Thirty-five dollars a month. Yeah. Thirty-five. Okay, so it's like seven bucks a week or nine bucks, whatever. Other than. He is the personification of all the other things that we've learned, seen, heard about uh, being tough as nails. And he really was this tall. Now, I exaggerate about the other guy, but he really was a little guy. He really was a little guy. And the, uh, and it comes from just down the road. And if you go down to Dunfermline, where he's from, there are a lot of buildings with his name, um, a lot of churches, a lot of endowments, a lot of trusts. Uh, Carnegie Mellon in America, the un great university. Um, and he, he went almost crazy giving his money away. Every time he'd, he, he'd put money into something, it would grow five times, and then, you know, which is an is a interesting challenge. The, um, you should, I, I would wish on all of you. Anything else about um, Mr. Carnegie? And he was not an alpha male, quiet, introverted guy, but ruthless. See, you can be ruthless and not be, and still be an introvert. The operative part is the ruthless part. Okay, last night you um, wrote your affirmations, correct? Uh, we're not going to do the affirmations on YouTube because we don't want them to be uh, memorialized forever. Not that I don't have confidence in your affirmations, but I would just as soon not have them, uh, somebody throw it up in your face. Okay, YouTube. Bye-bye.